first of all, thank you for coming. And this is a um, talk, well, a discussion that I was um, asked to um, bring about Dr. King's message in regards to not only us as individuals here, but also how it affects us as living in North Carolina even today in the 21st century. Um, this was really engaging for me to have um, this opportunity to speak because when I was a student here at Mars Hill, um, way back in the late 80s, early 90s, Dr. King's um, birthday was a holiday, but we still had school. We hadn't recognized it as a time off yet. And so a lot of times you were faced with the decision, were you going to go to class or would you go into Asheville to the march? Would you go to the breakfast or something else like that? And it was a hard decision to make. Now the easy decision because it's right at the start of the semester. You know, it's kind of hard to go second day of class, you tell the professor, well, you know, I'm not going to be there. And then I was here on, on scholarship, so there was always the expectation as an athlete, you know, you're supposed to be in class. You know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to be sitting up front and everything else, front and center. So um, those decisions weren't easy to make, but you think about what are you, what and why are you doing it? What for are you doing it? And as we honor Dr. King with this day, but as everybody says, it's not a holiday, it's a day of service. You have to think, what is the message and where we're trying to go? So first, I want to start off with this quote, and I hopefully gave everybody time to read it. And you can see it comes in 1950, uh, 1957, where he um, makes a speech about give, give us the ballot. And you have to think, everybody remembers Dr. King with the Montgomery bus boycott and the whole idea of not sitting in the back of the bus. But a lot of his marches following that was dealing with voting. How can you change your community? How can you change your state? How can you change your nation if you don't have a voice in what's going to be done? And that's the importance of voting. And it was at a time where blacks were not allowed to vote. There were different restrictions and guidelines put in place to keep them from having that ballot. And that's what Dr. King really pushed and the movement really drove was if we are going to be a nation of everybody being equal, then blacks should have the right to vote without all these prearranged ideas. And so when you think about that, a lot of times we think back again to the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, I've said, somebody's here from my class from 1865 to um, the president, they're gonna say, oh Lord, here we go again. But we think about the Emancipation Proclamation as Lincoln freeing the slaves. But again, we have to remember that that proclamation was very limited. He was freeing the slaves in the Confederacy, but then again, how could he free the slaves in the Confederacy when he wasn't even the president of the Confederacy? As I tell my class, you have to think about it like this in modern day terms. The reason that there's such a controversy that goes on in modern day is like President Trump telling Mexico to pay for the wall. He is not the president of Mexico, so how can he tell them what to do with their money? Same thing. Lincoln was not the president of the Confederacy. How can he tell them what to do with the slaves? But the whole idea was that it was put out there that this war, this civil war, was going to be fought over freeing the slaves, bringing them in to be citizens in America after all this time that they had been servants in America. At the end of the Civil War, you have three major laws that are going to, or amendments that are going to be added to the Constitution when the um, Republican Party takes control of Congress. We know you have the 13th Amendment that basically says slavery is no more. You have the 14th Amendment, which reverses the Dred Scott decision by the Supreme Court, which makes black citizens. Okay, now those slaves that have been treated or has been seen as um, not even Americans now, they have been absorbed and recognized as being citizens of this nation. But the thing that we want to look at is the 15th Amendment, where you can see the rights of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, and previous conditions of servitude. You are a slave, you are free, you are black, you are now able to vote. So you have this past 
1870 that now black people have the right to vote. Now they have a say in the government. So if that was the case, why do we, did we need a civil rights movement? If that was the case, what was King and those that were with him protesting and fighting for? Well, the case was that, as in most things, people will work to get around the law. And though, yes, the amendment was passed and ratified, <coughs> there was a focused effort by the establishment to limit or to set the guidelines to who could vote or how they could vote. How could black people vote? Well, if you're going to go and register, you had to pass a test, a literacy test. Well, it's kind of hard if most of you were freed slaves. And again, as a slave, you were, it was against the law to teach you how to read and write. So it would be kind of hard to pass a literacy test. Or you would have to pay a poll tax. You would have to pay a fee to be able to vote. Well, if you have no job or not a high enough paying job to make the money to pay the fee, again, you're not eligible to vote. So there were ways to limit blacks' access to the ballot. And those, got, those limits were put in place. They were established. That's what we come to know Jim Crow and we know about segregation. And so you say, well, where was the government? But you have to understand one thing. When you look at the U.S. Constitution, it talks about right here, by the United States or by any state. When you look at the United States Constitution, you always have to look all the way through. It's a long document. Very well. We know the, thir the first Bill of Rights. We know those. I know my First Amendment rights, Second Amendment rights. Well, you have to look in all those different articles. And Article 1, Section 4 talks about elections. And you see who controls the ballot. If you read right there, your access to the ballot is still controlled by the state. The state sets the guidelines. Now, you have Election Day. It's going to be on the first Monday, or the Tuesday following the first Monday in November, and when Congress is going to be set. But the state gets to decide when, where, and how elections for the representatives will be done. They get to set the guidelines. They get to set what box you get to check off. What is the criteria you're going to meet to be an eligible voter? And that's why you could have things like the literacy test and the poll tax and other ways to limit blacks access to the ballot because the state set it up that way. They set it up to maintain power over this new group of citizens. Think about it. If you've had over 230 years of telling black people that they're not even human, they weren't even citizens, that they deserve to be slaves, how all of a sudden are you going to say, boom, okay, the war is over and they're free, they're now equal. That momentum, that the momentum of history isn't going to allow that. The momentum of thought isn't going to allow that. And that's what we see. So, this is what Dr. King tries to set in motion. How do we fight this focus? How do we fight this mindset? How do we fight this establishment that the state has made to limit the vote? When we look at his campaign in the South, and you think about all the different pictures and videos that you've seen of the Civil Rights Movement, you've seen the beatings and the hosing down with the water hoses, the dogs, the violence, the, the shouting. What was that all about? Well, it was again, trying to fight for what was being denied, the right to vote. The root of the cause, racial segregation, the idea that blacks are different, and that difference means that they shouldn't be allowed equality. And how do you keep them from achieving that equality? You keep them from voting. Well, what do you do? To change that, over and over again, blacks protest. They march. They argue. They fought for that right. They faced the dogs. They faced the beatings. 
to bring about change, to force change. There was interesting, and if you, this is the day of internet and YouTube. If you didn't see it last night, and I know CNN has showed it before, they have a they had a um, great um, documentary last night talking about the power of the media and how the media played an important part in the civil rights movement, not just with King, but going back to the Little Rock Nine and everything else, the coverage by the news to bring this story front and center in people's living rooms, for them to see it on TV, for these things not to happen in a vacuum and people not know about it, but they have to see it, not just in the newspaper, but for it to be live on television. Well, you start having these protests that start to push for change, push for the right to vote, push for equality. And on August 6, 1965, you have the Voting Rights Act signed by Lyndon B. Johnson, a Democrat. Johnson knew what he was doing. He said by signing this, well, he was going to lose the South. Democrats were going to lose the South. And it's going to be bring about a change. But the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was important because, as the Department of Justice has stated, this is seen as the most important movement or act that the government has ever done in regards to equality, in regards to racial justice. It prohibits racial discrimination in voting. Everybody is allowed to vote no matter what color you are. And it's set in place, government guidelines, they went down to places that were inherently segregating or keeping blacks from voting came down to the South and forced them to allow blacks to vote. That's what made it so pivotal. It, it was when the government stepped in and forced the states to, yes, you have to treat blacks as citizens. You have to think about a lot of times when change actually happens in our nation, when our nation has actually changed, it hasn't been by us all agreeing, well, yes, this is something we need to do, and because the spirit of love and friendship, we do it. It has been forced upon us, and usually by force of the federal government. Go back to Little Rock Nine, if you saw the prayer breakfast. Ernest Green was one of the students that integrated... Central High, but they had to do it under the protection of the 101st Airborne Division. They had to call the Army in to let nine black kids go to a whole white school to force integration. Change is forced upon us usually by the government, by laws or sometimes by the military, but that's what moves us for. But you had the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that gets passed that is in regards to what King had been pushing these marches, these demands for equality. Well, that was an important thing because the Voting Rights Act of 1965, like I said, Johnson said there was importance about it that he would lose the South because the Democrats would lose the South. This is where you get the switch. A lot of times in modern day, especially in 2019, everybody's worrying about Republicans and Democrats. This is where things change. Remember, the Republican Party was founded, the Republican Party, yes, of Lincoln, the yes of Donald Trump. The Republican Party was founded as an anti-slavery party. And it fought slavery all the way up to 1965. So from the Civil War all the way to 65, the Republicans were pushing for equality. Democrats were the ones fighting against it. But then you have President Johnson who signs the Voting Rights Act and he stabbed in the back. So you have a switch. Democrats started becoming the party that 
pushes equality and pushes civil rights. Republicans start to become the party that sees civil rights not as a great thing, or maybe, uh, I shouldn't say a great thing, but something that needs to be pushed as hard. And that's where you get to switch. So that's why a lot of times when people argue and say, well, yeah, the Republican Party and Dem Democrats were um, segregationists. Yes, they were for a time. Then they switch. It was a switch, a handoff. Now, would there be a switch back? You, you never know. But that's why we study history to see what the story is all about. But the switch is very important because it brings us to, that was kind of the backstory to get us to where we're going right now as we talk about Jesse Helms and Harvey Gantt and their impact on us even today. Jesse Helms is a well-known North Carolina <coughs> political figure. He's the longest serving senator we've had in our state's history. He had many jobs before he was a senator. He had been a sports writer. He had been a columnist um, doing editorials and he had worked in different campaigns. Jesse Helms was seen or is seen as basically one of the founders of the conservative movement in the Republican Party. It was very hard to be more conservative than Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms kind of came into politics in 1950. In 1950, he was a campaign publicity manager for a man who was running for Senate, a man named Willis Smith. And Jesse, as the pu public relations manager, he led Smith's campaign in attacking his opponent, Graham. Um, their opponent was a man named Frank Porter Graham. And Smith portrayed Graham, who supported desegregating the schools. All right. Smith and Helms together portrayed them as basically an enemy to white society. They were out to mingle the races. They were out to cause chaos to society. In fact, they started circulating flyers right there at the end. White people wake up. Understand what's going on. If you vote for Graham, your community is going to be destroyed. He's going to let black people in. Those differences, those people. Again, America is always, we always find those people. There's always somebody out there that's a threat. That's what we do in American history. We find those people, and then we want to rally against those people, and that all of a sudden unifies us. Well, in that campaign, those people were black people who will be going to desegregated de schools. All of a sudden your child will be mixing in with blacks. So Jesse helps push this wake up campaign. And this was important because you have to remember this is 1950 so you didn't have a large black voting population again. Still had those literacy tests. Still had those poll tax. So blacks weren't vote. This was going against to the white community. Hey, we have to stay vigilant. You can't let your guard down. We can't let them in, because once you let them in, it's all over. So that starts Jesse Helms' interest into politics. Then in 1957, he wins a seat in the Raleigh City Council. And he starts pushing his conservative mindset even more. And then he backs in 1960 a friend, Beverly Lake, who was running against Terry Sanford. And Terry Sanford, another icon of North Carolina history. Terry Sanford also was talking about integration and how whites and blacks in North Carolina had to work together to push the state forward. Lake lost to Sanford. And Helms was upset that all of a sudden integration was going to happen in North Carolina. That racial mixture, mingling of the races, that was trying to get people to wake up, all of a sudden it was going to happen. 
he was dissatisfied. He found it even more, but he found an even better way to express his dissatisfaction. Right after the election, he takes on a big role, a, a new job. He becomes an editorial, or gets on TV at WRAL, big station in Raleigh. And he would give an editorial, I think every Tuesday night. And he would talk about the way things were in North Carolina, and how he saw what problems needed to be done and what needed to be addressed. And this gave him a platform because WRAL was one of the biggest TV markets in the state. And people got to see Jesse Helms and got to hear him and got to say, hey, he was Rush Limbaugh before there was Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> okay, everybody, oh, okay, well, this guy knows what he's talking about. And what was he talking about? Well, he used to get on the Raleigh News and Observer, the big paper in Raleigh. He used to start calling in. It was funny because he used to work for the Raleigh News and Observer before he got on WR. But then he started calling the Raleigh News and Observer the nuisance and disturber. Why? Because the News and Observer kept on pushing this liberal idea of integration. Jesse didn't like that. News Observer kept on talking about civil rights for blacks. Jesse didn't like that. They're a problem. They're fake news. He didn't like Carolina. You want to see Chapel Hill fans? Well, Jesse Helms didn't like Carolina. Too liberal. In fact, he stopped calling it University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and he would frequently call it the University of Negroes and Communists. Why? Well, because they were too liberal. And what was his grand plan for that university? He said, we need to build a wall around it so that liberal ideas wouldn't spread out and infect the rest of the state. So he wanted to build a wall before anybody else wanted to build a wall. And you see again how there are cycles in history. You don't think about that. Sometimes when you're sitting in class and you're wondering, will the professor ever stop and I can get out of here? But there's a reason why we teach it. He didn't like the protest march in 1963, the March on Washington, the famous what we talk about where a lot of times, especially on this day of Dr. King, when he gave, I, I have a dream speech. He didn't like that. In fact, he didn't like the Civil Rights Movement. And Helms, in fact, said this about it. He said, the Negro cannot count forever on the kind of restraint that thus far has left him free to clog the streets, disrupt traffic, and interfere with other men's rights. He later wrote on that said that the crime rates and irresponsibility among Negroes are facts of life which must be faced. I don't know those people that... I don't know how restraint that is. But again, the whole idea that these blacks were marching for equality, demanding that they be treated fair, he didn't like that. Some of that communist talk. So when that Voting Rights Act was signed in 65, him and his buddy down in South Carolina, Storm Thurman and some others, switched parties. Because all the way up until 65, Jesse Helms had been a Democrat. But Lyndon Johnson signed that law making blacks have the ballot. Jesse's dissatisfied. Switches parties. Along with a whole slew of Southern Democrats. They switch over to the Republican Party. And that's how Jesse Helms becomes a Republican. And that's how he is able, because he's had this platform to show how conservative and show that he's not going to be about changing his times, his whole liberal mindedness, how he's able to gain all the support and he gets elected into the Senate. And he's going to serve 30 years in the Senate. Five times he's going to get elected in there. So remember, six year term. So for all that we want to say that, oh, how bad Jesse Hunts, how could he think this way? There were a lot of people that seemed to have thought along with him for him to serve in the Senate for 30 years. Now, to continue on just a little bit more about Jesse Helms, and we talked about how he 
he didn't like or, or really agree with civil rights and integration. There's an interesting thing for this day with him. When they were debating or bringing up debating about making Dr. King's birthday a holiday, Jesse Holmes didn't like that. He didn't like it in a big way. In fact, he didn't like it so much that he filibustered. He held up the business of the Senate, trying to keep a vote from happening on Dr. King's, for making Dr. King's birthday a national holiday. What was his beef with Dr. King? Well, first of all, he questioned whether King was important enough to receive such an honor. Who was Martin Luther King Jr. for us to give him a national holiday? What had he really done for the nation? Also, he didn't like King because, remember, we sent a lot about the Civil Rights Movement, but King was a spokesman person on a lot of different other topics. How do we treat the poor? He was against the war in Vietnam. Jesse Helms didn't like that because he was against the war in Vietnam. He wasn't American enough to support our troops. Why should we give him a holiday? And he accused King basically of being a communist. Why should we give this Martin Luther King Jr. A birthday, he's not that important. He's anti-American because not only did he not support the Vietnam War, but his ideas and his rhetoric was communistic. He's a commie. That's the mindset in the history that Helms was going to bring into what we're going to talk about. That's his backstory. Now we talk about this Helms versus Gantt. Well, who is Harvey Gantt? Harvey Gantt, born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. Child of the South, child of segregation. Harvey Gantt took on hardship and difficulties He, in 1961, first went to Iowa State University for a year, then he came back. And he sued for entrance to the, I guess as you know now, the champions of football in college, Clemson University. He sued for the right to go in there, because Clemson at the time didn't allow blacks to attend Clemson University. And it went to the U.S. Appeals Court, and they said you have to let him in. Harvey Gantt broke the color line at Clemson. He's the first black student, black graduate of Clemson University. So when you talk about the Civil Rights Movement, he was part of it. You know, there are more, yes, today is Dr. King's Day, but there are a whole lot of princes and princesses and queens and other kings of the movement, both black and white. But yes, he's claiming the fame. He integrated Clemson in 1963. Went on to graduate with honors in architecture. And he became a well-known architect. If you're from Charlotte, that's where he was at. He's built some of the major buildings down there in Charlotte. And in 74, as he was working his business, he got into the Charlotte City Council. And he served there for a few years. And then in 1983, he became Charlotte's first black mayor. And he did two terms. The first black mayor of Charlotte. Southern City. So, when you talk about Harvey Gantt, you have to understand, he was used to fighting long odds, fighting against the expectation of, hey, being the first, being the only. Might have been awfully lonely in Clemson 
when not only are you the first, but you're the only black guy on campus. You think it's bad at Mars Hill because as small as our population, how, think how big Clemson is and you're the only black person there. Probably not too many people inviting you over, sit around in the dorm and let's talk about what was on TV or anything else. Who's going to sit next to you in the cafeteria? Who's going to study with you? You have to be tough. And I think that toughness was one of his cornerstones for where he was going to face because in 1990 he makes a decision that he's going to run for the U.S. Senate in North Carolina. And he's going to go against a man that already had been elected to the Senate three times in North Carolina. Jesse Helms. And so we're going to see the civil rights movement in Gantt take on this segregationist mindset of Helms and the clash. And it puts in display all the things that King have been talking and working against and the whole thing that they have pushed the movement for. When Harvey Gantt ran, Helms didn't waste any time. You needed that job and you were the best qualified, but they had to give it to a minority because of a racial quota. Is that really fair? Harvey Gantt says it is. Gantt supports Ted Kennedy's racial quota law that makes the color of your skin more important than your qualifications. You'll vote on this issue next Tuesday. Four racial quotas, Harvey Gantt. Against racial quotas, Jesse Helms. Let's do that again. You needed that job. And you were the best Don't qualified. Don't waste time. But they had Make to sure give it to a minority. The voters understood. Because of the racial quota. What the election was all about. Fair. Harvey Gantt says it is. Gantt supports Ted Kennedy's racial quota law that makes the color of your skin more important than your qualifications. You'll vote on this issue next Tuesday. Four racial quotas, Harvey Gantt. Against racial quotas, Jesse Helms. That was important because this race was more than just this young guy who might have done some civil rights of movement kind of things taking on Jesse Helms. Gantt was running against the pressure of history. He was running to be the first black senator from the South since Reconstruction. Over a hundred years that there hadn't been a black person voted as a senator in the South. Gant was doing that and going up against an incumbent. Helms understood that. He went back to his roots. It's us versus them. And if you let them in, namely Harvey Gant, we saw with the hand. He's out to take your jobs. Just like back in 50 when he was working with Smith. They're out to mingle the races. Get into your school. How much change do you want? And it was very important that Helms did this because you might think, well, Helms, it's going for his fourth. It's going to be easy. Well, North Carolina was changing at the time. 1990 wasn't 1960. More people had moved from the north down into North Carolina. It was becoming more and more, or at least seen as more and more progressive. I remember this race very well. I was here at Mars Hill. Class of 92. I was in the middle of 1992. It was big. Everybody thought Harvey Gantt was going to win. He had a chance to win. Every time they talked to people in the news or they did polls, it seemed like so many people were saying, oh, they were going to vote for Gantt. Or at least they weren't going to vote for Helms. In fact, six weeks from the election, there was a poll that was out. And this is what I'm going to read what the poll said. Helms have 46% of the people that said they will go vote for him. 46%. Gantt 
had 45% of the vote. They were neck and neck. Now, it was interesting if you break it down, Helms of support, well, the people that were going to vote for him, 56% of them were white. And 6% of them were black. What do you think it was for Gantt? Kind of hesitant, but for Gantt, 35% of whites were going to vote for him. All those northerners coming down. We got to get Jesse Helms out. He's bad. He looks bad for me. 90% of the blacks were going to vote for Gantt. Six weeks from the election, they were neck and neck. It might, it really looked like Helms was going to win. I mean, lose. Gantt was going to win or had a real good chance. The election happened. If you remember the election of 2016, I don't know how many of y'all watched Saturday Night Live afterwards. <laughs> and they had Chris Rock, and I can't remember who, it was Dave Chappelle, I think, and they were sitting there and they were with their friends and they were supposed to be watching the election results. And their white friends were, yeah, we're Hillary, Hillary. And then they, they couldn't understand why Hillary wasn't winning. And Chris Rock and Chappelle kept looking at each other like, how are y'all surprised? Are they happy? You know, they're like, really? Well, that's what happens with Harvey Gantt and Helms. Everybody has said that they weren't going to vote for Helms. Gantt had a chance to win. But Helms won. 52% to 47%. That's a 5%. That's not squeaking through. You're neck and neck, and all of a sudden, you bust the door open. What happened? I mean, there, there weren't any emails that you had to worry about. There, weren't, there wasn't Stormy Daniels or anything else like that. So how did Gant lose such a big margin? What happened? Well, it goes back to messaging. First of all, you have to consider this. The Republican Party did two things. Oh, I shouldn't say they did two things. There were two things that happened. One. Just before the election, all of a sudden, 150,000 postcards got mailed to black voters. Black voters usually vote for the Democrat. We already saw that 90% of them were saying they were going to vote for Gantt. In those 150,000 postcards that went out, I told them on the postcard that Voter fraud is punishable by going to jail. And you might not be eligible or really weren't eligible to vote if you have moved into your district under the 30-day limit. So the best thing for you to do is not vote because if you go and vote and you haven't been living in your district long enough, you are doing voter fraud and you can go to jail. Well, was I in the right district? If I'm getting this card, maybe I've done something wrong and they're just trying to help me out. So maybe I shouldn't go vote. I mean, why else would they send me a postcard? Yeah, it's not going to pick my name out of the hat, but they did. It just happened to be a hat full of black voters. Now, the other thing was an interesting twist to this. There was a letter that went out from the Visible Empire Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, you say, what does the Klan have to do? Well, obviously, they were sending out this letter telling everybody to vote for Jesse Helms because he was their boy, right? I mean, it's Klan. No. This letter was an endorsement for Harvey Gantt. The Klan endorsed Harvey Gantt. Now, why did the Klan endorse Harvey? I mean, the Klan is not known to be, you know, very supportive of blacks, and let alone black candidates. So why would they send out a letter saying, yes, we're in support of Harvey Gantt, and we want him to be our senator? Well, I guess it's kind of like Dr. Pye has some of her students here. Psychology, is that correct? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is this reverse psychology. Because what the Klan said in the letter was this. 
by having Harvey Gantt as our senator, it will prove how bad blacks are. Him being senator will show all the things that we've been talking about, that they're not smart enough, that they're corrupt, that they're going to do everything that's going to pull down and destroy society. So yes, elect Harvey Gantt so that he can prove the message of the Klan and show that they're not equal. Those two things together might have been enough to push people to go with the safe bet of Jesse Hammonds. I'll read the letter. It says, we sincerely hope Mr. Gant has the opportunity to put his ideas concerning abortion, affirmative action, government spending, etc., etc., into practice. We feel that Mr. Gant is the man who can best illustrate to the citizens of North Carolina what the Ku Klux Klan has been saying for years. We envision him as being the catalyst to a powerful resurgence of our hooded order in the Tar Heel State. May he fulfill the role admirably. He's going to prove the Klan right if you vote him in. So like the hands ad, the Klan message and the postcards out there, the message was clear. If blacks are politically active, if they use the ballot, they're a danger to society. They're a danger to the community, the white community, the power structure that has been in place for all these years. If you allow blacks to vote, they're going to take your job. They're going to overrun your schools, chaos in the street. It's us versus them. Now, Gant lost that race. Comes back in 96 and runs and gets Helms again, and he loses even at a bigger percentage. So Helms gets elected for a fifth time. So what does that all mean? Why am I talking about Gant Helms? That seems ancient. I mean, Mr. Helms has passed on. Harvey Gant is not running for anything else. How does that affect, how does this affect us now? Well, in a few ways. Thomas Farr. Who's Thomas Farr? Well, maybe I should say the Honorable Judge Thomas Farr. Thomas Farr was President Trump's nominee for the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of North Carolina. He was up to be appointed to the bench, to that seat. That seat had been held vacant, held open all the time of President Obama's presidency. He had nominated a judge, a black judge. And the Republicans had blocked it. For eight years they had blocked, filling that seat. Donald Trump came in and wanted to put Thomas Farr into it. Now, why am I have Thomas Farr and Jesse Helms together? They don't, they're not related, they don't look alike, but they do have a connection. Remember back in 1990 when I said there were 150,000 postcards that went out targeting black voters, talking about, hey, your eligibility to vote might be in question, and if you vote and you don't meet the guidelines, you can go to jail, well, guess who was the lawyer that advised on doing that? And I'll take away one of your choices. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Farr. Now, even more importantly, if you're into North Carolina politics and history, you have to remember that North Carolina, and we'll talk about this later, did some gerrymandering setting up districts and establishing what districts or who, again, remember the state can decide who can vote. And in the determinant of districts, the Republican-controlled legislature, based on racial gerrymandering, on a racial percentage, they went to the DMV and requested information from the DMV 
about where the black voters were. And they clustered them all and packed them in. That's why even in this past election, you can have all these votes, but if all black people are clustered in one group, their all voting point is not spread out, their voice is muted. But the reason this is important is that the federal government, the U.S. Appeals Court, the Fourth Circuit, came in just before the 2016 election and said that North Carolina those gerrymandered districts that were set up on a racial basis were illegal. Now who had led that? Far had led the whole racial gerrymandering. The district court came in and said it was illegal because the Republicans had targeted blacks with surgical precision in an effort to limit their vote, effort to limit their access and impact in elections. They have been targeted to mute their political power. Thomas Farr had been part of that, part of the postcards, part of the racial gerrymandering, and now Jesse Helms wanted to make him a federal judge. And remember, a federal judge is a judge for life. Do you think if your case is going up against Judge Farr in his court of appeals that you're a black person that you might get a fair shake or might not? He almost got it. What happened was it all of a sudden it started to break that who exactly is this guy? How's he going to get this judge? And it came down to two people voting against him. Were saying that they would not vote against him. You had Flake, who was getting ready, Senator Flake, who was getting ready to retire. And surprisingly enough, another Republican from South Carolina, not the one you're thinking of, black man, Senator Scott from South Carolina, a Republican, said, looking at Farr's record, he would not vote for him. And those two defections from the Republican Party stopped him from becoming a judge. But that's a modern take. A man who worked for Jesse Helms and that Harvey Gantt had worked to suppress the black vote almost became a federal judge. There's a long impact. History isn't dry isn't boring, it's active, it's current, it's relevant. But why? What goes on even more? Because far is just the tip of the iceberg. Dr. King saw it even back in 57. All types of conniving methods. Think about it. Power does not give up power easily. And if it loses the battle, it will fight another battle to regain it. One of the problems that we have in progress, one of the problems we have with civil rights, is that a lot of times we think the battle is the war. We think a victory in the battle, we've won it. Interesting enough, last week, Boston Globe said that racism is over in America. You can go in there and tweet. They said Dr. King's dream has basically been realized. Racism, only for a couple of instances, has ended. We've achieved. I tweeted them. I said, well, I didn't get that memo. <laughs> I said, you know, not me and me. I mean, it's not like, hey, people, somebody's throwing something at me, but yeah, you come on over here to Weaverville and Mars, you know, tell me that racism is <laughs> Who am I to dispute the Boston Globe? But we're going to see over and over and over again that power is going to work 
to maintain control. And over and over again, we win a battle and we convince ourselves, oh, the war is over. And we stop working. And we slide back. That's what this, from 2016 to 2020, all this disruption that we're having politically and socially, everybody said, oh, we got a black president, Obama. We made it. And so what? Everybody's shocked now that the realization, we didn't make it. We thought the war was over. The war is never. Power does not give up easily. If you've been in power, and, and this is not just saying white and black. This is men versus women. Women aren't still easy. Yeah, it's 2019. Really? Okay. Women still don't get paid equally. Men have been in control for centuries. Do you think that they're just going, oh, okay, well, it's 2019. Yes, ladies, we're, we're a treaty right now. Really? Well, tell that to all the sexual harassments and the lack of pay. If it, if it was so, so easy, why is everybody upset about Gillette, the Gillette commercial? But we convince ourselves of that. And King is warning us that, no, there's always going to be some conniving method that's going to work to keep you from winning the war. So you have to keep on fighting the war. The battle is the battle. It's not the war. What are some of the battles that we still face? Well, like I talked about before, gerrymandering. North Carolina still has to redraw the districts. We still haven't done it yet. It was too close. In 2016, we still haven't done it in 2018, and they're going to try to drag their feet to 2020. Why? Well, if you go back and you look in the paper, again, if you go on YouTube or you get on the Internet and you look up North Carolina and gerrymandering, you're going to see their clusters where blacks are pushed in. So instead of having a voice that's dispersed, it's centralized. That's why you can have so many people vote. Democratic, and still have a Republican-controlled legislature here in North Carolina. Are you telling me that this is only where the Democrats in North Carolina live? Nowhere else? The red? It's all Republican and the Democrats only live right here? Charlotte? Down around Greensboro? Really? But if that's what the district is drawn and they're all thrown in there, that's it. And again, you have to remember, who determines the districts? The state does. They're not saying that blacks can't vote. They're just saying where blacks can vote. That's different than, you know, it's not a literacy test or a poll test. Yeah, you can go vote. But it's right here. So again, they have to be redrawn, but we'll see how that works. Even more, why is this a point thing? Remember the 65 Voting Rights Act? Well, in 2013, there was a Supreme Court case. And the Supreme Court case Shelby County out of Alabama, not the Shelby County here in North Carolina. Shelby County versus Holder. I'm going to boil it down to what it says. Basically what the Supreme Court decided was this. That 2013, blacks have arrived. Like Boston Globe. Racism isn't around anymore. We don't need these restrictions anymore. We don't have to force the states to toe the line to allow this equality. We don't have to restrict them. They're going to do it because we're modernized. We're there now. So what, what the Supreme Court did was they came in and they took away those limitations they had put on the southern states. They came in and said that, hey, you don't have to meet these federal guidelines. The federal government is going to come down and say and see, hey, are you doing this? We know you will. And the state said, yeah, you know we will. And they, what did they go and do? They put new guidelines in. 
different type of guidelines, not literacy tests, but we'll talk about these guidelines in just a second, to limit the votes. Because again, where the act was working on, was all Confederate states, Southern states that segregated, took them away, all of a sudden these states started putting in place new restrictions on black voters. Remember the march? Some of you might not know. John Lewis. Probably the, the greatest living civil rights icon. People talk about Jesse Jackson still alive, Andrew. John Lewis. Congressman from Atlanta. He's the one, if you ever watch, them crossing that bridge there in Selma, Pittsburgh. He's the one that's his head cracked open, almost got killed there. He can still show the scar. Goes on and has been serving in Congress for over 30 years. He's the one that pushed them. If you ever go to Washington, D.C., and you want to go to the African American Museum, John Lewis is the one that fought for that since he got into Congress. He's the one that pushed it. But yeah, he gave a little blood for what now. It's starting to be gutted, that Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court is going to revisit that act probably this year. They could gut it even more, or they can decide to strengthen it. We shall see. But why is that important? How did they start to find limits? Well, when the, when the Supreme Court made that Swain Holder decision, Started to become very popular. Order ID to vote. Got to show ID. Again, a lot of people say, well, what's the big deal? Everybody has a driver's license. Well, not everybody. Again, I've talked about this in my other classes. Well, if you live in the city, a lot of people that live in the city don't have a car. Especially if you live in a big city, you know, why do you go pay for a car if you can take the metro or somewhere to go? Or if you just not wealthy enough to own a car. Cars aren't cheap. Maintain a car isn't cheap. Well, I have a driver's license if I can't afford a car. Most of those people who don't have driver's license are people of color. So if you say, hey, you have to have a driver's license to vote, and I don't own a car, and I don't have a driver's license, well, then I guess I can't vote. Oh, well, amazing that that seems to be targeted for black folks. Seems like a not threatening kind of law, but remember what King says? Conniving. Conniving means sly, slick, mischievous. Alright? Let's go, go around the back way. You're looking out front thinking <coughs> everything's good, and all of a sudden you turn around and you've been robbed from behind. So you have that voter ID. Don't think that's very important? Okay, well maybe you do have your driver's license. But remember, when we talked about back in 1990, those 150,000 postcards that went out that FAR had been a part of, you get this official looking document that says, hey, you probably don't want to vote because you might be in jeopardy of going to jail and it looks official, so hey, you don't do it. The thing is, a lot of times, why, why do scams work? You get a phone call, you answer up, sounds very first. Hey, I'm Jonathan McCoy from the U.S. What screw you, department. <laughs> we see that you haven't filled out your paperwork, and you need to do this paperwork, or you're, we're going to send the sheriff there to get you. So for us to process your paperwork, you need to go ahead right now and send me in your debit card $50. The sheriff deputy's on the way. Okay, well, here, here's my. Happens all the time. People get scammed, right? <coughs> well, happened this past election. The ninth district in North Carolina, ninth congressional district. Right now, they do not have a representative in the House of Representatives. They don't have a congressman because it's come out that there was a scam that went on. There were people that were going around to 
Well, it me. Black voters and telling them that, hey, you don't have to go on down there on election day vote. You can do absentee ballot, and we can help you fill out that absentee ballot. And even so, we're here not only to help you fill it out, but we'll take it in for you. All you got to do is right here. Oh, well, yes. You see, you see my badge? It looks real. Okay, well, yeah, thank you. Okay. Unfortunately, they didn't work for any campaign. Unfortunately, it's illegal for them to do that. And unfortunately, nobody can find those ballots. And all of a sudden, you had a man in a democratically controlled or leaning district win. The only thing was that he was Republican. How did he do that? Well, it seems that the people that were going out there taking those absentee ballots might have been working for his campaign. He scammed them. It's come out. Now everybody's in an uproar. The state Republican Party is saying, well, no, we just, he won it. Just go ahead and let him sit in there. Everybody else is saying, no, you can't do that. State Republicans say, yes, you can, yes, you can. They say, no. Well, why is the rush? Why not just have a re-election? Well, because he might not win then. But it seemed official, and those black voters lost their vote. Happens all the time. There's conniving matters that are going out to keep blacks from. And here's the thing: if if black voters weren't powerful, then why, over all these years, have there been so much work done to keep them from voting? Do you think that it's not powerful? Well, didn't go for it. We know what happened right down the street. Yes, election day. Students trying to go down. You have the right as a Mars Hill student, even though you might not be from Mars Hill, North Carolina. You might live in Durham, but you go to school here. You have the right to vote here in Madison County. But it seemed that there all of a sudden there was some black students. Who went to vote and were told that they couldn't? That's a fact. Happened here. It's going to happen down in Texas at Prairie View A&M. Over and over again. Stop that voice. Stop that ballot. So who has responsibility? We do. Because what happens is a lot of times this way of history, people start seeing it, this gerrymandering, this voter suppression, and they say, okay, I give up. It's not worth the trouble. Who cares? And then you end up having this. They found that people that didn't vote in this past election, voting's not for me, my vote doesn't count, oh, it's too much of a trouble. You know what they realized a couple weeks later is, excuse me, but damn, I should have voted. <laughs> that's, what, that's what this is all about. No, I hate politics, you know, whatever. Oh, man, I should have voted. Your guy might not win, but he'll probably definitely lose if you don't participate. It's like homework. Just because you do it doesn't mean you actually pass the class, but I guarantee if you don't do it, you're not going to pass the class. That's correct. You know, so you got to think about that. Well, that's what but a lot of people buy. Well, you know, what about this vote? I'm going, so they don't participate. That's what they're counting on. That's what the gerrymandering, that's what... All this is about. They're counting on getting you to think that your voice doesn't matter. That you're not important enough. So you just say, okay, whatever. And if you don't participate, you're allowing somebody else to be your voice. You want somebody else to talk for you? No, you just sit there. Let me, I'll, I'll tell you what you want to say. Really? I go to that 
that cafeteria every day. I hear y'all talking and everything else. I have never seen anybody sit up there and say, hey, yeah, you talk for me. I'll just sit here. Y'all seem to be very opinionated. All that slam this last semester, there was a lot of opinions that were being thrown out there. So if you're able to talk then, why aren't you going to talk with your ballot? Leadership comes in all shapes, sizes, ages, color, religions, gender. Again, yes, we're honoring Dr. King, but it's more than his king. And he realizes it, that there has to be leadership from the ranks. The movement only moves when the people work to move it. By you coming to this institution, you're not coming to be a follower. I doubt that anybody here is sitting here, hey, I'm going to go to Mars Hill for four or five years just so I can follow along with somebody else. You're coming because you want to blaze a trail. Either you're going to be bringing some people with you or you're going to blaze your own trail, but you're not coming to be a follower. You're coming to be a leader. That means leadership is active. It's not passive. It's not passive for four years. I just sit here and, okay. And then you flip a switch after you walk across that stage. You have to learn how to be active now. Am I saying you got to go out and march the street? No, you might not be a marcher, but you can go work at a food man. You can go tutor somebody. You can go and find something to do. You can go when there is a activity going on and just be there and support. That's leadership. Because there's probably a whole bunch of cats that are sitting up there in the dorm today saying, Phew, we got a day off, man. And I ain't got no Tuesday, Thursday class either. Ooh, four day weekend. I don't know if I want that person being my lawyer if I'm in trouble. Dr. Barber, he stepped forward. Again, if you're not familiar with a lot of North Carolina stuff, Dr. William Barber, or as my brother, who is a fraternity brother of him, calls him, oh, you mean Willie? I said, well, I've never really heard anybody on call Dr. Barber with Willie, but this one, that's my brother calls Dr. Barber started pushing In 2013, he started pushing in North Carolina a thing called more majority. No, not more majority. More Mondays. I'm sorry. <laughs> it started more majority. Something totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, more Mondays they used to go into Raleigh and protest in front of the state legislature, trying to call for them to be more. equal in their justice, equal in their mindset, to understand that we're all God's children. He gained a big national following. He started to lead not only marches, but sit-ins in the state legislature. You may have seen him on TV, him and Others of his supporters and um, colleagues getting arrested. They protested the HB2, the bathroom bill. Protested about education spending. Protested all the different things that they saw that the people in North Carolina weren't being treated as equals. Be it in financially, be it because of their color, be it because of their gender identification, sexual identification, whatever. He started to push that. That's why there were more Mondays. In fact, his drive is seen as one of the elements that helped torpedo Pat McCrory's run for re-election. This movement of morality, this push for justice, inspired by his hero. Dr. King. 
again, Dr. King's message wasn't just for blacks, but it was for all Americans. And even not just Americans, for all people. All colors. When you see King, you see men and women marching with him. Whites and blacks. Jews and Gentiles. Across the board. Because the message is that we're all God's children and we all have the right to equality. And that's what Reverend Barber pushed. And so, over and over again, Dr. Barber led these protests. And it was a realization that civil rights is about human rights. And in this day and age after desegregation, after integration, who are the people that are still hurting? Well, people of color, women, people who don't fit that quote unquote conservative model. But more likely is those that don't fit that mindset that's still based back there in segregation, us versus them. This is part because Barbara realized that the message was that there are a lot of people who don't have a chance because of their financial status. Poor people. They're being disenfranchised. Their voice isn't being heard. Their vote isn't counting. And so he decided that he was going to start putting in place and pursuing a poor people's campaign. This was one of the last things King was working on before he was killed. Start up this. How are we going to... You can have the power to vote and you can use the power to vote, but what are you going to use it for? If you don't have economic stability, if you don't have housing, if you don't have the things that make you a stable citizen. When he decided to start pushing this poor people's campaign, he decided he had to leave the NAACP, Barbara did. He was the leader of North Carolina in WACP. It was interesting when he when he made that decision that he was going to start promoting and pushing for equality um, in medicine, the Affordable Care Act, for protections for all people, be it whatever race, whatever sexual orientation, gender, things like that. When he decided that he was going to leave, the head of the, or the chair of the state Republican Party, Dallas Woodhouse, this is what he said when Barber decided to leave the NAACP to start this poor people's campaign. He says, I think it would have helped him and all his causes had he been more of a negotiator than an agitator. That's the same thing they talked about King. He was an agitator. He's coming in, stirring up all this trouble. When you know you're doing it right is when the establishment starts calling you an agitator. <laughs> then you might be on to something. When you start making people uncomfortable because you're not in there screaming in their face or dog cussing them, but you're just putting out there that Explain to me how this is logical, or how this is equal, or how this is fair, and they feel threatened by it, then you might be on to something. He wants all people to have a, a chance at equality, financially, protections under the law, where they work at, no matter their sexual identification, or their gender, or their color. And he's seen as an agitator. It goes back to things that we've seen Helms was against. Oh, well, those liberal ideas, letting blacks think they're equal, mixing those kind of things. It's dangerous. They're going to take what's ours.
So what it's all about is that you have to find your campaign. When we talk about the power of the ballot and you have to use the ballot or lose your voice, a lot of times you're going to get stuck on this whole idea of who you're going to vote for in 2020 for president. <coughs> but here's the thing. Yes, president election is very important, but it's no more important than who is going to be your representative in the North Carolina legislature. Who's going to be your mayor? Who's going to be your sheriff? All those down ballot races were just important, and maybe even more because they are the ones that probably have more of a direct impact on your life. If you're so worried about what's going on with Donald Trump that you're not seeing what's going on in the General Assembly of North Carolina, you're going to see that you're going to get gerrymandered out of having a voice. And you're going to say, well, I was worried about Donald Trump. <coughs> Conniving ways. It's like magic. Look over here. Why the real action is over here. What are you going to focus in on? How are you going to use your voice? What are you going to be active in? What issue are you going to take to heart? As I finish up, I always, I always remember this, being a student here. And I don't just say it because he's sitting in the audience, but I had Dr. Lindbergh. And I remember Dr. Lindbergh talking about Vietnam. And he was talking about the war, and he says, wherever you decide when it comes to a warfare or whatever issue, make sure that you know that's what you believe in, whatever side you're on. Don't let somebody else tell you what to believe. Don't blindly follow along. Don't just say, oh, well, that's what they say we're supposed to do and go do it. Make sure you know. Educate yourself. If there's an issue out there and you believe it, make sure that you believe it and that it's not because CNN or Fox has told you what to believe or your friends sitting next to you what to believe. But you believe it. And then you go do something about it. And one of the first things you have to do about it is probably vote. So you can find somebody who also believes like you and put them in a position to help maneuver us in that way. We're not all going to agree about where we need to go, but we should agree that we all have a voice in trying to decide. If you don't vote because you don't know or you don't care, you're giving up that vote. You're giving up that voice. You're giving up control. And again, as long as I've been here, for all the interaction I've seen and been with, I've yet to meet a student who has walked around and said, yeah, just control me. Y'all fight for independence all the time. Well, this is just another front in that war that you have to use. And Dr. King understood that. And that was the push of the movement, energizing people so they can vote. And that's why you have to study. And that's why he would preach and talk in his speeches. He always gave the history of why he was doing or promoting what he was doing so people understood what the message was about. It wasn't just something on, we decided on to understand. So hopefully you go away with something to think about. Again, I'm not saying that you know we wake up tomorrow and everybody's marching around the campus with you know signs. I mean, you might have one. You might want to do that. But to think about what is important to you, and if it's important enough for you to think about it in your dorm room, think about it when you're laying in that bed. Then what are you doing to make it happen? That's what it's really about. And that's what he was calling about. What are you doing to bring about the change that you foresee needs to be for this to be a better place? And that's what it's all about. Thank you for coming. Okay, my name is Jonathan McCoy. I'm class of 92 here at Marshall University. And so I'm... Um, as I was a student here, I was also the first um, black um, student body president that Marshall had in its history. 
Um, I've come back with my wife. We returned to be on campus here. I'm uh, now a professor of history, and my wife works in um, this office of she well, she's in charge of the office of assessment and um, evaluation here of um, at the university. And so um, I'm an alumnus and, and a faculty member. And okay. Jonathan, we're studying about racism, and I wondered, have you experienced racism? I think yes. I think that when you talk about isms, um, be it um, racism, um, sexism, even um, ageism, as, um, as we see that a lot of times um, older um, adults um, are um, face prejudice against them because of their age. Um, we all experience some of those some of those things and racism, yes, um, and not and, and surprisingly not a lot of people think, oh, Mars Hill and um, the Western area, you experience it. Yeah, yes, I experienced it here as a student and um, someone as an adult, as a student, was more adverse. I was here in in the late 80s, early 90s, so it was more uh, prevalent. One one thing I, I was here on a football scholarship and bus went by. You know, kids would yell out the N word at us all the time. So everybody knew if you, as a black student, if you didn't want to go through that, them yelling that at you all the time, then you wanted to be across the street before school let out, and you knew when 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 the bus was coming. So that was over over things that you know think okay, well here in rule, but even coming from Raleigh. Uh, urban center, you you, you um, see it, um, experience it. Um, so it's it's not just a regional thing. It's it's a it's um, it's an everywhere thing, and it's because um, there's a preconceived um, lessness because you're different. Um, you you've heard and seen people clutch their bags or the security guard follows you in in in, in a um, store. Or um, they people will talk to you because they they think that you might not. They'll talk slowly to you, so they they have to explain something to you, um, and and then oh they they'll find out oh well, or be surprised oh you have a college education oh wow or um, there there are there are a lot of things that a lot of people are surprised oh you've never been arrested or uh, or the idea that. Um, I don't have any children, me and my wife don't have any children, but I don't have any children out of wedlock or anything else like that. Um, surprise, my, my parents have been married going on 55 years. Well, you know, they've been married to, you know, those kind of things because there's this expectation or this view that black society is a different way, different expectations. They, um, you know, as a man, I have several girlfriends, but I'm also married or, or, or I'm out um, to rob people. But also you have to understand this, and I think that it's also um, in going with, um, as you deal with in the church, that racism isn't just white to black or black to white. It can also be inside of your own color identification. So it was the idea that racism or any of those again like those isms I talked about before is because for some reason you view these people as different and that differences make them less and unfortunately I think we all experience it in some way um, racism just is a little bit more easier to identify because usually it's based on color and you can really see that color difference yes. uh, Jonathan you told me that your father was a pastor and that you grew up in a church and I know we hear, I've read articles where it says that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. Do you think that we should worry about that, that we're not worshiping together? And if so, what can we do to, as white churches, be more welcoming to people of color? And, and the research does show that, that, that really from 11 to 1, and across America, that is the most segregated time, and even even in integrated societies, we we one as human nature, we like to go with people we know or um, people who um, have a shared history or experiences. So that's one thing that pulls us out. So one thing you have to be really conscious of that. Um, so both the black and the white churches have to push 
integration. They have to force themselves to get out of their comfort zone. Just like all things in life, we, we're comfortable, but does that comfort expand us? So we have to push. We have to be conscious of them and push. Uh, some things that um, help keep us separated. Services are different. They're, they're, and, and not that there is a difference in religion of, well, they, we blacks see Jesus different than white people, but the way that expression a lot of times if you go to a service, a, a, a black service, a lot of times people talk about how dynamic and outgoing and uplifting it is. But we have to see where it's really.